Morning, Lou. Welcome to Morning. everyone who is joining us for the Wednesday class that shall not be named. Looking forward to studying with everybody. Happy New Year. We hope everyone has had a great start to the new year and that you're enjoying everything. We're going on to YouTube now. That was my wife. And I hope everyone is doing well. So I'm going to take back control. I had to go on to the other side. I'm on here twice. So I'm going to take, get rid of that other one. How's everybody doing? So welcome to Michael and Arlene and Ron and Larry and Jane and Flossie and Lou and everybody watching on YouTube. And welcome to my empty office because I had to go through my empty office to get onto YouTube. And I'll probably just clear that out right now. And I hope, again, everybody had a really good um, New Year. Everybody, Anybody do anything exciting, like Michael? <laughs> yeah, Ollie and I stayed up until after 12. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and I know Michael stayed up to way after 12 in America because he was in Vietnam. Did you just go to Vietnam or did you go to Cambodia as well? We were in Cambodia as well, yes. Did you do Thailand and Laos? No, just Cambodia and Vietnam. That was the best too, probably. That's awesome. Yeah, it was it was really good. I really like Cambodia. Yeah, I haven't been there in 20 plus years, but it was amazing. Yeah, it would have been nice to be invited to go with you, Michael, just to let you know. Next time. No, I mean, I wasn't going to be able to go. It would have been nice to be invited. Did you just, yeah, did you just go yourself or did you go on a tour? No, we were on a tour. We were on a That's tour. Awesome. We, spent, uh, we spent two days on our own in Hanoi and, and that was fun. And that was good because tours never take you everywhere you want to go. No, it's nice to have something. And uh, anybody else do anything exciting? How was the wedding? The wedding, I did a wedding which was amazing. Beyond belief, uh, I did a Jewish Indian wedding in New Orleans. Uh, mm -hmm. So for John Cohn's daughter, Rachel, and a wonderful young man named Mitch, whose family are B'nai Israel, that means comes from a Jewish Indian in India population that may go back farther than 2000 years. So most of them moved to America, but he still has family in Mumbai, but it was an incredible four days. There was a big event Thursday night that was completely Indian. Then there was a long rehearsal Saturday, Friday morning. And then Friday, we had a rehearsal dinner and then a big party after that. And then Saturday was the wedding. And after the wedding, a re small reception. Then we did a New Orleans walk where you follow a bat, ragtime band to a bar and then hung, they hung out there all night. And then the reception was on Sunday and it went from 7.30 to 1.30 um, on New Year's Eve. So it was really, I left right after the fireworks because I had to wake up early to come back. And Rabbi, was it a mix of Hinduism and Judaism? Or no, no, it's a, it, B'nai Israel, he's, uh, he's, he's Jewish. Their family goes back probably 2,000 years in Jewish India. The bride is Jewish as well. The bride was from our congregation, yeah. She is uh, John Cohen's daughter, Rachel. So she grew up in our congregation. Wonderful couple. <clears throat> Absolutely spectacular wedding. Really unbelievable. And so, uh, Happy New Year. Uh, my wife was not able to go, so my brother came in because uh, my daughter got COVID. So, wow. And so he actually got to stay in town to see the Sugar Bowl because the University of Texas played in the Sugar Bowl. I came back. And then watch this almost win. We 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 got close. So Did you drive or fly? I flew. Yeah. Okay. I probably would have taken about the same amount of time to drive back. So oh, probably. <laughs> so what we're gonna do today as we start the new year is we're gonna do biographies. We talked about doing that. And so um, the first one we had talked about doing was, of course, going to be um Shammai and but mostly Hillel. So what we're going to do is go over a little bit of uh, the great Hill, sage Hillel, Hillel, and we'll talk a little about him. 
and his effect on on the world and and one of the greatest obviously sages of all time and i'm going to get to the notes as soon as i can find them they seem to have disappeared from my computer so i will find them eventually uh, Lou, what did you do for new year's by the way just went across the street to the neighbors and had dinner over there i was home by 10 30. how oh, good <laughs> so i watched the ball me. fall at midnight and then went to sleep all right and uh, anybody else do anything exciting? Uh, the Sun Crowd in New York. Yeah, Did, was it that, was a million, it? million people there in New York. Wow. Well, we went to New Orleans. I'd really not been there except for once for the GA. And, you know, you think of Savannah as being a party fun city. And then you go to New Orleans and realize we're just the minor leagues. <laughs> exactly. But the World War II Museum, if you haven't been there, is really fascinating. Uh, we were there for at least five and a half hours and did not finish it. And mm -hmm. The Jewish Museum of Southern Jewish Life, the Institute for Southern, is also in New Orleans. So we saw that. And Glenn Kersey, for those of you who know Glenn, has a, his picture is up there okay. from his time in Fayetteville, Georgia. And we have a picture from our synagogue. And then we also have a, there's a description of the history of Mick Israel there. So it's so pretty cool. So, as for the great Hillel, uh, I think we've all heard of him. Has everybody heard of him? Okay, good. <laughs> and I Sorry. think uh, the question is always, who was he? And we're going to talk a little about him and a little bit about his the importance he played in Jewish history, which cannot be underestimated. Obviously, he is one of the all-time greats. And what we'll talk about a little bit is, is when he lived and the time period and how that affected him. And of course, we'll talk about his relationship with uh, Shammai. Shammai, I guess, never gets his own biographical talk. It's always in connection with Hillel. So who is Hillel? We got to remember, we're living in the first and late second and early third, I mean, sorry, late second, first century and early first century of uh, CE. So he's born BCE 110 and he dies in 10 CE. So that's, if you add that up, that is of course 120 years. Now, is that actually how long he lived? Who knows? Because obviously 120 years is considered the longest you can live as a human being. And does anybody remember who lived 120 years also? Moses. So Moses lived 120 years. And so obviously you can't live longer than Moses, but if you're an incredible sage like Hillel, then you live 120 years and that kind of connects you to the greatest of the great, which is of course Moses. So he is born in 110 BCE. So this is after the Hanukkah story. So it is during a period when the Jewish community is in control of Israel, probably called something different last, last at that time period. He is not born there. He is born in Babylon during the Parthian Empire. Remember, Jews had moved to Babylon during the exodus from um, after the destruction of the first temple. So in 586, the temple is destroyed. Part of the Jewish community is sent to Babylon. Later, they're invited to come back, but some stay in Babylon. And he is from that community that stays in Babylon over those hundreds of years. Probably more, uh, probably a wealthier community, more educated community still, because it's in the Parthian Empire. And he wants to come to, of course, Israel or Palestine to study with the great sages there. Now, You've all heard of the Babylonian Talmud. That's the main Talmud. So the main Talmud was written in Babylon, where the general area was held. But the great sages do not move to Babylon until the third century CE. So it's not to the 200 CE that the great sages start moving to Babylon. So when Hillel is being raised in 110 BCE, the great sages are not in Babylon yet. So at age 40, it says, 
he goes to study in Israel or Palestine uh, at that time period. So he wants to study. We don't know a lot about him. We know he's from the tribe of Benjamin on his father's side, but the reality and the tribe of David on his mother's side, but the reality by that time period, we're not sure if everybody knew the tribes they were from. This, the information we're getting is from the Talmud, which is much less concerned with history. Uh, there's a little bit from Josephus and more concerned with, um, so he lives in Jerusalem. So he moves there around 70 BCE. And he's going to live there until 10. So he's going to live there 80 years. Very similar to somebody named Moses, who at a certain age goes to Egypt. And then at 80, will. so he moves to Jerusalem. Eventually, while there, um, uh, the great emperor Augustus kills uh, who did he kill? Uh, a friend of, what's his name? Who did he compete with? Mark Anthony. Kills Mark Anthony, has him killed, and he is now emperor. And a man named King Herod, who we mentioned, who had buddied up to him, becomes king of the Jews. He is Edomian. He is not a nice guy, as we know. This is the time period where Hillel is living in this period. So it's a period where Jews are control or had been in control. And now the Romans have taken over and King Herod will eventually become king years later. So he moves to Jerusalem. He's like a woodcutter. He won't take money from his brother. His brother wants to give him money to kind of get the kudos from his Brother being a great scholar, kind of like what my brother does to me, wants to give me money to get the kudos of me being a great scholar. Nobody got that joke, but it was really funny. <laughs> um, except if my brother offered me a lot of money, I would be righteous enough to take it. But he has never done that, so well, never mind. So he moves and he's a, you know, is it? He's kind of trying to, he's a woodcutter. He's trying to find jobs because he wants to basically study. It's kind of like being an actor in LA. You know, you're, you're a bartender, you're, you take odd jobs and he's taking odd jobs and using the money to pay for studies. Uh, and that's one of the most famous moments we hear about him is he wants to study under Shmaya and Abtalion, who are kind of a, great sages of the day, but he doesn't always have enough money. So, you know, the famous story is he goes and he doesn't want to take money from his brother. So what does he do? He sits outside and listens through the window. And what happens is he basically lives there, you know, falls asleep or he's studying there and he's blocking the sun. And people want to know why is the sun being blocked? Obviously, you need the sun to see back then. And that's, of course, they find Hillel there. And he is obviously a great scholar, but we also have to look at who he is representing. In the New Testament, they talk of the Pharisees. In the New Testament, often the Pharisees referred to are the Jews. But the Pharisees are only one group of Jews. This is the group of Jews that wants to study, wants to talk about being a good human being, wants to start praying, and they're in competition with the Sadducees, who are the priestly group that runs the temple. So he's part of this Pharisees group. They would later become the rabbi. So when we say Rabbi Hillel, that is an acronistic title. So he would not have been known as Rabbi Hillel because the term rabbi will not come around for many years after his death. So when we say Rabbi Hillel, he would have never actually been called Rabbi Hillel. But he was an excellent student and considered one of the greats. And Menachem the Essene, who is the head of the school, eventually retires. And he becomes the head of the Sanhedrin. 
He's very famous. He did the pros bull, which is a way of canceling debts. It's basically to ensure that people are not, don't lose their home. If you can't pay off your debt and you're going to lose your home, then the state will come and help you. And if you're a landowner and somebody's not paying you and you don't want to kick them off, but you need to make a living, the state will come and help you. So it's a way of making sure that people can pay their rent, but that the landlords who need the money will get paid as well. So he's only well known for actually a couple of edicts. We think of all of these great edicts from Hillel, all of these laws, but most of them come from what we would call the house of Hillel, or which is the school that comes after he dies or you know, the, after he dies, his school has a lot of laws, 300 plus, that are in the Talmud, in the Mishnah, and Baraita, which are edicts that are outside the Talmud. So his school becomes very prominent. So he is the head of the Sanhedrin for about 40 years during some tumultuous times. It's the time of Herod. Herod, of course, is killing people his own people. Um, he is very destructive. And so Hillel probably had to avoid getting into any issues with him. He lived during the time where the, the, um, the priestly group and the Pharisees are really starting to have this combative division among them as they start to fight, not fight, but I guess, fight for the future of Judaism. Will Judaism be based on the temple and the sacrificial cult and the connection to the Romans? Or was it going to be connected to the prayer, the study, and the, you know, what we would call the uh, prophetical Judaism, the being a good human? Who wins out be between the Sadducees and the, the Pharisees? Do we still sacrifice animals? No, no, we do not. Not in front of other people because it's embarrassing. But it was the Sadducees were really in control. They were, even though there was a Sanhedrin, the Sadducees and Herod were really in control of the country during this period. It's not going to be until after the destruction of the temple that the proto rabbis. The Pharisees actually take control. So he is known during his lifetime, not as much for his edicts, but for his sayings and for his demeanor and his support of the poor and indigent and the everybody. He is also very famous for being more lenient in his beliefs. So today we'll talk about it later. We hear a lot about the debates between Shammai and, and Hillel. They debated with each other, although they most of the time actually agreed. There's only three times they didn't agree. But this is during a period called the Tanitic time, where you, in order to be a great scholar, you had to have an opponent scholar. So to be a great scholar, I would need Larry to have be the opposite. You know, Muhammad Ali needed Joe Frazier. Well, actually, Joe Frazier probably need Muhammad Ali more. You need to have somebody who is opposing you. you. If a Democrat has to have a great Republican in order to be considered amazing and in order to be the top of the heap. So when Hillel became the head of the Sanhedrin, Shammai, who was kind of his friend rival, became the vice president, basically because you needed to have this discussion. This is one of the great things about Judaism that I think the world can learn from us. And Jews today can learn from the past is, in order to be great, you need to have a rival who is as great as you to compete with. It's kind of like Larry Bird needed, you know, Magic Johnson, you know, it elevated their game. And that is what it did for Shemai and Hillel. We always talk about how great Hillel was, but really may not have been as great if he didn't have Shemai, somebody to bounce off, 
Um, I remember, anybody remember the, I forgot the commercial, they used to have the commercial of the, who was the, uh, the very famous Democrat and the very famous Republican, and they were always on the opposite viewpoints, but they were friends. They did these funny commercials together, went out to lunch and just, but they always, I can't remember the name, which ones it were, but it was very cute. And this is what, at the best Halal and Shammai. What is ironic is even though Halal and Shammai were probably not enemies, after they die, the schools will be enemies of each other's frenemies. They will be very divisive. It is said that you, if you were from the school of Shammai, you could not even pray with this, anybody from the school of Hillel and vice versa. So they became, for the, after Shammai's death for about 200 years, they became very, very big political and religious opponents of each other, which is not the case with Shammai. Shammai and Hillel actually agreed on almost everything, but there was a difference. And the main difference that continued through the ages was how strict do you follow the law? Now, obviously, at this time period of Hillel and Shammai, the Mishnah hasn't been written, the Talmud hasn't been written, but people are still discussing things and deciding how strictly we should follow, how to create the law. And it's known that Hillel was a lot more lenient than Shammai. And we know from a lot of the, the sayings, you know, uh, when somebody said, how do, can you teach me how to become Jewish while standing, you know, while standing on one foot? And Hillel said, don't be ridiculous. I mean, Shemai said, don't be ridiculous. And Hillel said, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto yourself, which became really famous as the golden rule. He actually said, do not do unto others. So the golden rule, the support for the poor. Shemai, on the other hand, was born wealthy. Um, he was not what you would call as, as good with people. You know, Hillel was very good at relating to people. He was probably a very good order, very Hamish, where Shammai was a little bit more abrasive. Although the truth is, Shammai knew of his detriments. He would comment on how he was trying to work on them and how you're supposed to have a good demeanor, understanding that it was something he did not have. Uh, Shammai would live from 50 to 30 so from 50 BCE to 30, so he lived 80 years. And when Hillel died in 10 CE, Shammai would take over. And from 10 to 70, the school of Shammai would really control the Pharisees. They would control the Sanhedrin. So we think of Hillel having a longer term in, in the Sanhedrin. Now he did serve longer as president of the Sanhedrin, but because um, he served 40 years to Shammai's 20, but Shammai's school would stay in charge of the Sanhedrin for the next 40 years after Shammai died and really control it. And what happened was they became more strict after he died. And this is one of the debates is how strict do you need to be? Funny enough, it is still the issue today. Um, Shammai again was from Palestine. He was an engineer. He was a little difficult to deal with sometimes. He wasn't a misanthrope though. He was not as well read, but he was firm in his belief. Um, he wanted to make the famous stories. He wanted to make his young son fast on Yom Kippur. He wanted to make his little kid fast on Yom Kippur. And his friends had to convince him, no, he's just a little kid, you know. Now, why did we have this division? It's the exact same thing we have today in America between the more traditional in terms of the more, the more orthodox and the more liberal. And that is, what is our relationship with the outside world? Shammai was much more, let's be friends with the outside world. We have to deal with them. Let's look like them. Let's make sure we can, people want to convert or welcome that we're more lenient so we can, you know, kind of get along with our neighbors. And Shammai was more, let's create a barrier between Jews and Gentiles. Um, 
you know, we don't want intermixing. We want our borders between them to be less permeable. And while the Hillel, the Hillel was basically, we need to make friends, especially with the Romans, because they controlled the world. And Shammai was like, forget the Romans. Their school was like, we need to almost rebel. We need to separate, do our own thing. So Shammai's school really determines the course of the last 60 years under Roman rule. So after Hillel dies in 10, Shammai's school takes over. And for the next 60 years, they will create the stringent, try and create the stringent separation and kind of and marginalize the Hillel supporters, which of course, in the end, who wins out Hillel or Shammai? Who would you say is the more prominent rabbi today? Thought Who's more thought of today? Hillel. Oh, Hillel. Hillel. In fact, you rarely hear Sh most Jews will never even heard of Shammai. And if they have, they will only know him as the guy who loses debates to Hillel. That is because, uh, Larry. No, I'm sorry, continue. Yeah, go on. Uh, all right, so after the destruction of the temple in the year 70, the Romans are very harsh. And eventually, who do you think is going to take over the Sanhedrin? It's the disciples of Hillel, who realize we may have made a little bit of a mistake here. We should have probably been a little bit more supportive of Rome, not because we want to be Roman, but because we don't want to be killed <laughs> in a war. So some of the zealots probably came from the school of Shammai. Now, Shammai himself was not as stringent as his students. We have to remember that. So, so, um, so this, under them, the Sanhedrin became much more of a reclusive anti-Roman uh, which was problematic at best. But they did stay in control for a very long time. But obviously, afterwards, the later... So basically, during the six-year period, during the two schools, Shammai and Hillel, almost everything went sh Shammai. But after the destruction, after the Hillel... Supporters eventually take over the Sanhedrin. They kind of grandfather the Hillel viewpoints into power. So they take away the stringent, more divisive. Now, it doesn't mean they want their children marrying Roman, you know, pagans or Christians. That's, but they definitely want to be a little bit less more lenient on Jews who are not so traditional in their viewpoints and they wanted to be less divisive between the Jews and the Gentiles because obviously they were in control of the country. Now, when you look at some really interesting discussions on it, and one of my favorites um, comes from um, a belief system um, that basically is the idea that in this world, we need to be more like Hillel. We need to be more lenient in our rulings, more understanding, make sure we make kinships and connections with people who are not Jewish for the betterment of our people in the world. So in this world, we need to be more like Hillel. However, they believe once we die or once the Messiah comes, then we will be more like Shammai, more strict. Once the Messiah comes, we don't have to worry about, you know, adhering to the society's codes or worrying about other people. Once the Messiah comes, then we can be very strict and implementing all the rules to the exact, you know, period and exclamation point. But until the Messianic area, era, we have to basically be more like Hillel. Now, what's also important is, even though Hillel wins out on all the arguments, what do we know from Judaism? When Larry and I argue, even though Larry will win almost every argument, because he's basically a genius, 
we still keep my opinion on the books. Because at some point in history, my opinion may start to take precedent over Larry's, which of course we know will never happen. So from that belief system, some people believe that today we should be more Hillel. Hillel wins, Hillel wins almost every argument, their school at least, according to the Talmud and Mishnah. But once the Messiah comes, that's when we go to the minority opinion and we'll start looking probably or possibly more to what Nishmai said. We can be more strict in the Messianic area because we're not worried about persecution or any issues like that. So um, again, when it comes to Shammai, he was a great sage. He does not get a really good, he doesn't get the kudos that he probably should because his school that came after him was more strict. But again, as with Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier, you needed perfect opposites. For those of us who are tennis fans, Roger Federer and Rafael Nadal, two great tennis players, very different. Roger Federer is smoother. He is serve and volley. He has this crisp game. He is like a gentleman. He can play for six hours and he doesn't sweat. Whereas Rafa Nadal is this gritty player who is just going 110% on everything, hitting the ball super hard. Roger Federer is better on, on, on grass courts because you can go to net more. Rafa Nadal is better on clay courts. They are the exact opposites, but they're friends and they get along. And there's a debate on who's better. And that's kind of what Hillel and Shammai were during their lifetimes. They got along. They were the opposite. Hillel was, came from a poor family. Uh, Shammai came from a rich family, more aristocratic. Um, Hillel came from Babylon and immigrated to Palestine, where Shammai is born in Palestine. Shammai is, of course, uh, more strict in his viewpoints. Hillel is more lenient. Shammai is a little bit irascible. A little bit, not not as bad as he's portrayed, but he is kind of can be a little harsh, and he knows he needs to work on it. Where Hillel is this fluid, mensch, quiet, where Shammai is probably a little louder. So the exact opposites, which makes it perfect for that time period. Uh, Larry and then Michael. Yeah, I was wondering if maybe you could help us out here a little with the timeline. The temple is destroyed, and most of the Jews are exiled to Babylon, but some still stay in Palestine or whatever it would be called. Not at all. Not at all. So the temple is destroyed. The first temple is destroyed in 586 BCE. Right. So that's when the Jews are, are uh, most of the Jews, at least the leadership are sent to Babylon, 586 BCE. The second temple is destroyed in 70 CE and the Jews are not kicked out to Babylon after that, they're just not allowed, they're basically kicked out of Jerusalem. So some Jews do leave the country, but there are Jews who stay in the country. But at 586 BC, I thought they were exiled to Babylon. They are exiled to Babylon. And right. Hillel comes from that group of Jews who are exiled to Babylon. Okay. So his family had been living in Babylon, I believe, for 470 years. But some of the Jews must have stayed there. And uh, my, my real question is uh, about the Sanhedrin. So when was that reestablished between the 586 and the, um, you know, the 70 uh, AD when the second temple was destroyed? But when was the Sanhedrin established? And what did they actually do? What was their function? That's a great question because the answer is debatable. We don't have exact information on the Sanhedrin, but we have general ideas. Now you have to remember also that there are different Sanhedrins at different periods in time. And so we you know, try our best to understand what they are. So when did the first the Sanhedrin? Uh, some would say it was probably during the Persian period. So after the, um, after the, um, destruction of the second temple and we go to babylon 
the Babylonians are defeated and the by the Persians. So the Persians take over in take over Israel, Palestine. It's at that time it's, it becomes called Judah or Judea, somewhere around 535 BCE. So they take over then. Now the Persians are a lot more lenient when it comes to uh, countries. So they allow countries to kind of run themselves. So sometime during this Persian period, they created a Sanhedrin, a great Jewish house of learning and courts. It could have been probably um, sometime in the sixth, fifth or sixth century. So the 400s, 300s, 400s, 500s. Um, and that's when Jews started coming back from Babylon to... Um, exactly. So, so sometime um, in the 5th century or 4th century, 300s, 350, sometime around there, they created the Sanhedrin. And this is a court... Now we're under the Persians, although so this is a court that is responsible for judicial decisions around the country, but also for uh, legislative, but also for religious. There's not a so they have religious edicts. There's a Sanhedrin like the Great Sanhedrin where it's, it'll be in one place, and they'll have the judges there, and then they'll have smaller ones throughout the country, and then they'll have members of the Sanhedrin, you know, as you know, again, again, you know, depending on your, your personality, depending on who, where you come from, depending on your age, depending on your mind, you might be in the great Sanhedrin in Jerusalem, you know, creating these edicts, kind of like the Supreme Court, you could be at a smaller Sanhedrin around the country, and, and, and sit bigger cities. And then you might be kind of like an itinerant Sanhedrin member, kind of like the Wild West, where judges would go to different cities, you know, they'd be responsible for an area. You could be a member of the Sanhedrin during that. So the Sanhedrin is considered all of that. When they say the great Sanhedrin though, it usually means kind of like the major center. They didn't have nine justices. I think they had 23. And so that would be in one area. And that stayed until the Christian era, era sometime in the 5th century CE. Now, was... Last week or a couple of weeks ago when you talked about Hanukkah, I thought you made a very good comment about the reason that Hanukkah might not be such an important holiday was that they tried to um, coalesce the two um, major um, uh, leadership roles, the rabbi or the chief rabbi, or whatever, chief priest, whatever it was called, at the court system at the one time. Was there a chief rabbi at the time, or was there, or was it the leader of the Sanhedrin, did he have that one single role? Was he almost the king then? No, well, it's different. I mean, again, the Sanhedrin is not the, uh, most of the time is not running the country. You know, they have a leader who is designated by Persia, who's running the country. The Sanhedrin is more judicial and sometimes legislative, uh, but they're not the political leaders of the country. That was one of the problems with the Maccabees. So the Sanhedrin has less or more power depending on what period you're in. During the Roman period at different times, they had less power when we were controlling the country. And all, it just depends on who's in charge and what's going on. So the Sanhedrin usually had a leader uh, chosen by the Sanhedrin. Um, we are not 100% sure on all of them if that act, the dates are not 100% sure. Obviously, the farther back in time, but this is a general belief is that sometimes in the 4th century BC it was founded, and sometime in the 5th century CE it, it ended. So we're talking about 750 to 800 years that it was around. Was it around contiguously and continuously? Uh, that is up for debate. Probably not. There are periods like during the Bar Kokhba revolution that and maybe times during the Herod 
that it may have uh, during the Roman other periods that it, it ceased to exist, but it was there probably uh, a good period of time. Uh, the head of it was always called the Nasi. And that's the, the, the head. So Yehuda Hanasi means prince, basically. Um, so sometimes it had up to 71 judges. Sometimes it might have 23 judges or elders, as they were known. Um, so basically, it existed. We just don't always know how powerful it was. We have a list of leaders. We have a list of people who were in it, but a lot of that comes from the Talmud, which is not a really great historical document. I mean, it's just, it's not a good document in terms of dating things and giving, you know, exact timelines. It's more of a religious judicial document as opposed to just a, so it existed. We know that Hillel really was, Hillel and Shammai were the start of almost a new era on it because they were basically, um, you know, kind of the start of this point where you had two people who were in opposition to each other. And they really started this period in many respects called the Tanaim period, which is a period which led to the writing of the uh, Mishnah. The Mishnah is the first part of the Talmud. So they are really the ones who set the stage for what would Judah Hanasi would do 200 years later. That's how revered they were. And so I hope that wasn't too confusing to everybody. Basically, the Great Sanhedrin was there over a period of 750 to 800 years. Sometimes it was more powerful than others. You know, they had the main one, but then you had smaller Sanhedrins around the country. You know, like Savannah would have a Sanhedrin, but the main one would be for in Atlanta. And then to go to like Vidalia and Albany, you would have an itinerant traveling judge, maybe judges that would go and, and, and at different periods and serve the people there so they could serve everybody. Um, yes, Jane. I think that um, Michael had something. Michael, to Michael. No, go ahead, Jane. Does the Sanhedrin exist today? Um, I was at a meeting the other night and some of the women were talking about getting a get. And it seems to me it, it's about the same as the Sanhedrin. There's no Sanhedrin. Uh, the Sanhedrin was considered almost a Supreme Court for all of Judaism. That is That doesn't exist at all today. Um, I mean, it, maybe we could all get all Jews together to support somebody like Michael. But besides that, we could not get all Jews together to support anything. The Romans officially ended it. The only time there was an attempt to create a Sanhedrin was when Napoleon was taking over Europe, and he was actually very supportive of the Jewish community. He had a, and he wanted to create a Sanhedrin, but the reason was to prove that Jews were dedicated to France. So that's really the only attempt that there has been to create a Sanhedrin because Jews have gone in different places. Basically, what happened was in the 200s, in the third century CE, um, the Jew, a lot of the Jewish leadership, is both politically, financially, but also religiously, moved to Babylon, the Sassanid Empire, where they were welcome. And then, of course, the Muslims would take over. So it created a rift. You had a lot of Jew educated Jews in Babylon and Palestine, which was the, one of the first times that you had two different places with this type of education. And eventually Jews became too scattered to have a Sanhedrin. We always had a place where the most educated Jews generally lived or like where was the center of Jewish learning. It became Babylon, then it was Spain. Eastern Europe, and today it's probably Israel, but there's never been a Sanhedrin. And if there is, 
hopefully they'll elect me. Michael. Okay, two, two questions. Um, one, um, the, uh, the Sanhedrin during the time of Hillel, um, you know, is there evidence that the Sanhedrin made decisions favor, favoring Hillel or should I, you know, more or less? That That's one question. And, and the second question is, you know, we talk about Hillel always prevailing, but do, do we really have, do we have examples, specific examples of interpretations where Hillel prevailed? And, you know, that that's something that I've never, never really seen. You know, I've just heard the... the, the yeah, that's a great question. question. Yeah, the answer is definitively yes on both counts. When Hillel and Shammai were on the Sanhedrin together, act the actual people Hillel and Shammai, uh, especially when Hillel was Nasi and was president and um, Shammai was vice president, they generally agreed on things. You know, there's three major uh, debates between the three. They did disagree on how to follow things, but they agreed on most things. So we have copies of those three where they, and when it came to after Hillel's death and especially after Shammai's death, there are hundreds, I'm guessing 300 to 350 debates between the two. And we have records of a lot of them. And generally speaking, Hillel wins on almost every time. But again, this is post- destruction of the second temple really around 80 and 90 when Yohanan ben Zakkai who was became the, the Nasi uh, the Rabban that gave him a title he would be the and then Hillel would start to win everything and basically posthumously they would overrule the the courts from the previous periods where Shammai had won out to school Shammai and overturn it and put it to Hillel. So during the, really after Shammai dies, he dies in 30, I think. Uh, so for 40 years, basically Shammai dominates the court. And then maybe for 10 years or so after the destruction of temple, they continue to do so. But eventually Hillel's followers take over and they will dominate for the rest of the period of Sanhedrin. Uh, Larry. You know, it's funny when, when I think of Hillel, uh, two things come to mind. The first is, um, you know, uh, explain the Torah, stand on one foot and, you know, be good to each other kind of thing, uh, which she's famous for this little quote, you know, that you could put up on. Right. It. But the second thing you think of is that um, the lighting of the candles in Sanaka whether they're right to left or left to right, which I've always thought was, okay, they both have interesting arguments, but nothing that's earth shaking, you know, but aside from that, um, you know, I, I don't get much out of Hillel. I, Cause I don't know the 350, you said there were 300 right. debates of, of what, what, what really significant, I guess, did he do uh, either as leader of the Sanhedrin or in addition to the, or is it just that one quote that we six in our mind that, uh, you know, that made him famous? Well, unfortunately, a lot of what was done was not written down during his time period. There were some rules about writing things down. So he became more famous for his, you know, less for his decisions than his demeanor, his ability to create harmony, ability to negotiate, that's what he became. It's kind of like Isaac Luria. Isaac Luria is the father of mysticism, and he wrote nothing down. You know, all that was written came from his disciples. So Hillel became very famous for his ability to find simple solutions to issues, to help work with the Romans, and to and he was a brilliant scholar as well. But a lot of the stuff wasn't written down. So. We don't have a lot of those arguments from the time when he was living. We have a lot from the time uh, after he died from the school. So a lot of what we know from him comes from his students. And the fact that he was so beloved, that continues on. So, uh, you know, basically he was brilliant, but he was also beloved in demeanor and how he was able to simply find answers to solutions and he was modest, but in a way that really engaged everybody. 
So there's, you know, he's famous, as I mentioned, for the, for the, the, the a couple of edicts. One was about, again, canceling debts. You know, that was a real problem because for many reasons, uh, if I'm a landowner, I need to get paid. And if somebody's not going to pay me, I, I need to find somebody who will. So he, wanted, he found ways to satisfy the landowner, but also make sure the renter was satisfied. That was important. He, he made sure to help with the, the, uh, the jubilee year and sabbatical years. You know, every so often, you know, debts were canceled, you know, seven years in some cases. So why am I going to give a loan if I know it's going to be canceled in two years? It just doesn't make sense. So he helped circumnavigate that so that there could be banking. Um, it so is also that the, the colleges, of course, have Hillel organizations, you know, that they I will go. Yeah, exactly. Mean, you know, uh, they're conservative. Are they conservative? Yeah, they're conservative. Hillel, no, no. The, everybody. the Hillel's on colleges are nothing. They are not connected to any movement at all. So they are completely open to everybody. That's the whole point of Hillel. That's one of the reasons it's called Hillel. It's open to everybody. Hillel was known to be open to everybody. People wanted to convert to Judaism, people from wealthy backgrounds, people from poor backgrounds. He's basically, that's what he's known um, for doing. And so that's why they're, that's basically why, why they're done that. He's known for being very pious. I guess that might be the best word. He's called Hillel the Elder, but would probably be Hillel the Pious would be even more. You know, he, he wanted peace. He wanted to have, to live under Roman rule peacefully, as opposed to creating havoc. And he helped create some sort of stability very during a time that was very turbulent. Not only the Rome just recently taken over, but they installed Herod as king. And Herod, of course, was a terrible human being. And so he had to manage that as head of the Sanhedrin. He probably had to have personal dealings with this madman who's running the country. Um, and so that's what he became more famous for than for his actual edicts themselves. So it's kind of interesting that, you know, if you're a mensch and you can help other people become mensch lakite now, what he also did, which was, again, we have to remember a lot of the stuff attributed to him comes later. And so is it attributed to him or to the school of Hillel? I mean, again, a lot of it comes later, but he comes very famous for his ability to interpret the law. And I don't know if you've ever heard of the word hermeneutics, but that was something that he really became famous for is how to interpret the Torah and how to interpret the Bible and how to interpret all the writings. What are the rules for interpretation? And he is the man who's credited with writing them. And that is basically the, his rules for how to study are still what are used today for people studying the Talmud. What are code words? How is punctuation used? Uh, gematria, the numbers putting onto words, I mean, to letters and adding it up. The rules of study. And again, you cannot study the Talmud without knowing these rules. There's the words that mean one thing, but they also mean something else. And so he is the one who started this process that 2,000 years later is still the way we study Torah and Talmud. And that's probably one of the reasons he became so famous is because we still use his, his system. You, so did you go on. Did HUC use the, his rules as well? Everybody does it. Yeah, it's universal. Um, because... The way the Talmud and the Mishnah is written, you have to use these rules that were based on him and his school, because you see this word and you know it means one thing, which it does, but it has a second meaning. It can mean, well, this means, you know, he supports this person or this means this word means it is a metaphor comparative to this metaphor. 
So you have to know those rules or else you're going to miss a lot. And that is what he's also now. Did he write these rules again? They're attributed to him. You know, did he actually do it? Who knows? But they are attributed to him in his school and they are essential. You cannot read the Talmud from a Jewish perspective without these rules. So, I mean, you can in, in English in the translations because you can always initiate the, tra the translation with the rules. But in, in Aramaic and Hebrew, you got to know these rules. You got to know what these words mean. And he also established the rules for these numerologies, establishing numerical equivalents. Yeah, he, yeah. Well, he's he's uh, the one I believe credited with giving numbers to letters. Now, did he actually do that? I don't know. But you also have to understand when you read the Bible, if you read it, you notice mistakes. There's some mis grammatical mistakes in there. So. If you have the belief that there are no mistakes in the Bible, then you have an issue because there's obvious grammatical mistakes, at least, but they're not mistakes. So you have to figure out what does it actually mean? So you need these hermeneutics as well, though less so. But he's one of the ones who also instituted the belief that the Bible is holy, all these books, you have to figure out what the meaning is you're just missing it. It is, you know, the Bible is not wrong. We just, you know, it, it just don't understand that particular passage in the way that it should be. And often there's a letter missing or letters misspelled or past goes to present, present goes to past. And, and you know, so, but he, you know, helped create the belief that it doesn't matter, that there's, it's not that it's wrong. It's that we haven't figured out what it means yet. Kind of an off the wall question. Great, it's my favorite. I mean, this is. I mean, there's no right or wrong, but it's just just dawned on me. What if Hillel were alive today? Would he be Orthodox, Conservative, Reform, uh, Reconstructionist, uh, New Branch? My guess, if he was alive today, he would probably be more conservative because he really would still support the law, but he would be a little bit more lenient. And I think he'd be very supportive of the reform reconstructionists. You know, he would be somebody trying to bring us all together. Um, whereas Shammai, his school certainly would be a very strict Orthodox. So Hillel, I think would be, you know, someone kind of like, uh, you know, the uh, former chief rabbi of England. Sir Jonathan Sachs. Sachs, thank you. Um, who's he's Orthodox, but he's very supportive of all the other Jews. He may follow the law, but his laws will be written in a way that can be supportive of everybody. He'd be a little kind of like that, I think. Rabbi, is it in the yeah. is, it, is it in the Talmud that they have uh, the box in the middle and then the commentary on the sides, or is that mm -hmm. it? Yeah, yeah. It, 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 who's are the only two commentaries Shemai and Hillel or are there other no 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 right. Shemai and Hillel are not part of the commentary so the Talmud and we can go over this later the Talmud has the section in the middle that's the Talmud and then you have the commentaries on the outside Shemai and Hillel are you know are very early so they're only in the Talmud and Mishnah the commentaries are later people that came afterwards so they they were you know the the the, the mission is finished in the year two hundred, you know, Hillel dies in in ten a year. Who decided which commentaries to put in? The Mishnah was decided by a man named Yehuda Hanasi and his group. He was the head of the Sanhedrin, and then the Talmud was decided by Babylonian scholars through the ages. That it was probably cut codified or codified in the years in the sixth century CE. Um, but we don't know exactly the names of all of them that made the final cut and did it.
but but I think I've seen Hillel and Shammai in the in the Kabbalah. They're in the Talmud. Yeah, they're in the Talmud. In the but Talmud. they're not. In, they may be referenced in the comments, but they are old enough that their their discussions will be in the Talmud. Often those discussions though are from the school of Shammai and the school of Hillel, as opposed to actually Hillel and Shammai. Although Hillel has a lot of his sayings in the Talmud especially in the uh, uh, section of called the uh, an ethical section called Pirkei Avot. But the dis debates between them are mostly the debates between the schools. So, because there really was only a couple of times where they had major debates themselves personally. All right, excellent. <laughs> so what we're gonna continue doing per request is we're gonna continue studying different uh, scholars, namely the ones we uh, discussed when we were, um, when we did the thing on the most important Jews of all time. So we'll be discussing various scholars or famous Jews. Um, we started off with Hillel. Does anybody have a preference for who we do next time? I was thinking of Herzl, Theodore Herzl. All is right, Herzl it is. <laughs> Certainly. Uh, or yeah, we don't need, we're not going to do them in, in order of time period. Obviously, if we'd done it in order of time, we would have done biblical characters first. Like Stephen Wise. I just saw a, an excellent documentary called Spiritual Audacity. I don't know if you've seen that documentary mm -mm. about Rabbi Wise, and it's uh, really sensational. Well, we will do Herzl next week then which is very apropos, obviously. We pray continually for the state of Israel. And always a pleasure. And Michael, thank you, by the way, for, for the kudos for the Federer-Nadal comparison. We could also go with Borg and McEnroe. I mean, for people who watched it back then, uh, those both those. Novak Djokovic, who's probably the best player, he doesn't quite have the same complete difference from anybody else. So it's hard to, to do with him, but Borg and McEnroe would be a very good example as well for us tennis fans. It also could be for the Philadelphia Eagles and the Dallas Cowboys. The Dallas Cowboys are heavenly bound. They're the good people. Um, and the Eagles are the essence of evil. So that those would be another good example. You know, this week, Washington plays Dallas. As a, as a lifelong Giants fan, th this is great. If Washington wins, they screw Dallas, and they screw themselves because they'll right. get a lower draft pick. I mean, a Giants fan couldn't ask for more. No, and if, if, the, if Washington wins, you know, then Dallas is you know, lo probably loses out to Philadelphia. But if right. Dallas wins, then Philadelphia loses out. So it's a win-win situation. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys, a pleasure as always. Please stay safe. We do have services coming back up Friday night. We'll have a special visitor, Julie Hirsch, and her family. We're very, very big parts of our community for many years. And then Saturday, we have our new member brunch. I mean, new member service. We'll have a special program, but then we'll have a special lunch. And please, everybody's invited to everything, even if you're not a new member or you're an old member. Um, so again, all our best. Happy New Year again. And uh, we will the Indian wedding also. If you have any pictures that you want to show, maybe I do. I put a few. I didn't take as many as I should have. I I, I put I, I put a few on on on. I didn't take very many of the actual Indian when they had the Indian oh, event. I felt kind of uneasy. I guess taking pictures of everybody because everybody was dressed up in those beautiful outfits. I probably should have, uh, but it was really nice. I, I'm not a big Indian food person, so I didn't eat much of that, but. Uh, I did go to get some beignets at Cafe du. I got beignets at a place, and because I didn't want to wait in the line, and they were they were not very good. And John Cohn, the father of the bride, was like, you know, let me take you to Cafe du Ma, but I didn't want to wait in this line. The line was literally probably an hour and a half, two hour line. Really? He said, if you if you're from New Orleans, you don't. He so he just walked in and we sat down, and they served us right away. <laughs> so this is what the people in New Orleans. So when I was taking my brother the next day to do the same thing, I noticed that there was a very long second line. And that very long second line was for people to sit down. So they may not have. So I, I, I we didn't get to have those. But the 
beignets there were absolutely delicious, yeah. whereas the previous ones had not been. So that there was a big difference. So yeah. you said the and, reason- Museum of the uh, World War II was sensational, huh? It's it is really quite impressive. Yeah, I, as I said, we were there a very long time, and we didn't we we had to rush through the last section because uh, I wanted to buy some some uh, some stuff. Yeah, it's outside. So we didn't. We, is it outside the city or? Uh, no, no, it's very. It's a. It's it's you know, fifteen twenty minute walk from Canal Street. It's really close, and the Jewish Museum's right right there as well. But I mean. I mean, the, the exhibits, if you're reading everything, I mean, you could easily be there all day. And then they have a 45 minute movie that they also show that was really, and then there's little other movies and then they have a section for the liberators liberation, which was had to deal with the Holocaust. They have a section, which, what was when he, which as uh, the um, D-Day and the European conflict. And they have a section for uh, the, Pacific, which we was the one we rushed to because we didn't have time. They have a, they had a special exhibition on women during World War II, and uh, they have some other exhibitions. They have a section on some of the planes where you can see the planes. You get a little thing where you can pretend you're in a submarine, uh, which was really interesting. So, really quite impressive. And the Jewish Museum was amazing too. Yeah, they're famous for the concrete boats, I think. They came out of that area, you know, where they made those concrete landing boats. Uh, that's right. They talked mm-hmm. about those, the amphibious boats as well, so the ones that failed miserably and the ones that did well. So they went into a little bit of D-Day, but, I, you know, I'd read several books on, the, you know, D-Day. So, I, you know, so they, they they did a really nice job. They could have done more. They, they mentioned some of the issues with D-Day and all the problems, but you read the books about it and you realize, boy, there were a lot of problems. And then anytime you hear the word Omaha, you're like, oh my God, that's the worst word ever because that was a beach that was mm-hmm. completely uh, secured by the Germans. It's right near the so, Museum of Southern Jewish History, you say? Yeah, they're very they're very close. And that museum is really nice too. It, it's, you know, you can do it in an hour easily, but it was really nice to see a museum just dedicated to uh, Jews of the South, which of course a lot of people don't much know much about. Those of us in the South know we're better, but you know most <laughs> people don't realize that. Well, thank you guys. All right, baby. Absolute pleasure. Hopefully, I'll see you this weekend. If not, hopefully next week. And if you need anything else, let me know. Thanks, everybody. Join us next week. We're going to study the man, the myth, the legend himself, Theodore Herzl, the founder of Zionism. So we'll see you next week, everybody. Thank you. you. Bye-bye. Bye. Oh, shoot. Larry, you still yeah. on? I'm so, still on, yeah. Yeah, don't go off. I, okay. You know, like, you know, like what we did on this trip, you got 10 minutes? Absolutely. If you're, I, I don't know, can we still stay on? Yeah, uh, yeah, I think so. And uh, I have about 10 minutes and then I oh, have yeah. to... Uh, Fill me in. I'm really have to go, but um, you know, it was uh, it was so different from anything that we've done. Have you have you been to Asia? Yes. Okay, but not not Vietnam. Lynn, I'm on I'm on a Z, an email call. Lynn? Jane, could you call Lynn Mooney back, please? Jane, could you call Lynn Mooney back? Okay, I'm sorry. Oh, say hi to Lynn. Um. You know, so you haven't been to Vietnam then? Uh, no, we've been to Thailand and Cambodia. Okay, so okay, so I'll I'll just skip. You know, the, the time we spent in Phnom Penh and Siem Reap, although Siem Reap is pretty amazing, isn't it? Um, Siem Reap is wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, but you know, Vietnam, Saigon, and they call it Saigon more than they do Ho Chi Minh City, which I I, I was a little surprised. It's nine million people. It's more people than New York. It's just this huge city. Um, probably my least favorite place, actually. Um, it's it's bustling. It's uh, pretty modern, um, and and just you know there are hundred million Vietnamese. There are over fifty million motor scooters hmm. or motorbikes. Try to cross the street. You know they they say you close your eyes and pray, uh, but but you get used to it. Um, so that that was um, that was okay. We went to the tunnels, and, and that's just outside of Saigon, and the uh, Chuchi tunnels. 
where the Viet Cong would, you know, would hide and uh, and prepare and uh, whatnot. And that was that was very interesting. Uh, you know, we were able to go into one of the tunnels, very narrow. Uh, of course, I think it's been sanitized uh, a little bit. Um, but that whole that whole area around the tunnels is it's just fascinating. You know, it kind of reminded me of the bullet factory in uh, in Israel uh, for, for the uh, for the ingenuity uh, yeah. of it. Yeah. Um, it was very 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 uh, very very uh, ingenious, and and you know, so that that was interesting. Uh, the the air, I, I'm still sneezing. I, I've been coughing, and it, it's all from the pollution there and I, I think mostly from the pollution of Saigon, although there's been up in Hanoi also. Um excuse me. Uh so that that was that was okay. Uh that was nice. And then we went to uh, uh we went to Wei, you know, which is a uh which was a capital at one point. So you have so you have the the castle with you know the moats around it, big area. Uh, very old. Uh, some of it got hit during the, the war, but they, they've kind of re, you know, put it together. Um, and and that was that was really interesting. Uh, my favorite place was Hoi An, uh, which is very touristy, but it's it's just kind of like uh, you know, if you, you the the touristy areas. There's no very few cars, and then it's right on the river. And you can walk along the river. There are lots of merchants. It's touristy. You can go onto the river on a boat. Uh, you can buy it at nightfall. You, you buy a candle for 10 cents and you put it in the river. You know, you make a wish and you put it in the river. The thing is, you know, illuminated. Uh, mm -hmm. That was very nice. And I had probably the the best uh, Vietnamese meal that I had. The food's, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's nothing exciting. I mean, but... Uh, in Hoi An, we we went to a restaurant just just fabulous and uh you know and everything is very inexpensive that was an expensive dinner uh that cost about twenty dollars uh and it was uh it was really good uh eating the uh the uh the greens from sweet potatoes oh, it was called morning glory and they saute it in in this case in garlic and it's just just really delicious and uh, and I had this whole fish, um, kosher fish, by the way. Uh, and uh, that was they, they really prepared that, that that very, very, very well. So that, that was good. Uh, um, so I, I kind of liked it. it. It was a little more civilized in, in a sense, even though, again, first, um, you know, China Beach, which has a, a certain amount of fame, uh, very pretty beach, really nice. And you know it's not that much different from Myrtle Beach these days. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the, how this was in Way, the Nang Way, that pretty close together. Uh, and uh, I guess it's Nang, but uh, you know it, it's just it, it's so modern. Uh, sky high rises. Uh, it's just it's just amazing. And an example of that is we went to a. Uh, a hotel bar, a rooftop called the Rex. And uh, during the uh, the American War, the uh, the uh, staff, senior staff, used to go to this bar every day at five o'clock to discuss the the war. Only then they could see out, you know, twenty, thirty miles. They could see the battlefield, sort of. And now. Is kind of surrounded by high rises, um, you know. It's, 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 you know that was a, you know, that was a, uh, you know, overpriced drinks. Let's put it that way. And uh, but but a nice view. I'm glad we did it. It's just kind of one of the historic. Hanoi, uh, it's just very interesting. I mean, it's just in in a sense, it's getting very modern. In another sense, with all the street food, it's it's you know still traditional. Uh, we went to the Hanoi Hilton, which which you would really like uh, because it has very little to do with the, the war. Uh, the the uh, Hanoi Hilton was built by the French, 
and they used it to torture Vietnamese political dissidents. Um, so that's what most of the exhibits were about. And then there were two or three rooms about the, uh, the time that they kept American prisoners there. And, and that was the only time during the entire trip that, um, you know, that we uh, were uh, exposed to uh, out and out propaganda and, and bullshit. There's no other way to phrase it. Uh, they had these pictures of how well they were treating the prisoners and, you know, they made it seem like you were actually at the Hanoi 